I, I did want to say the, the thing you guys did the other day where you talked about the very first issue of Hellboy, that you point out something that I wouldn't do now. And you were exactly right. Ah, oh, cool. Um, there's it, a it, it stuck gun. out like a sore thumb for some reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny. You guys did it. I mean, I've seen various people do kind of analysis of my stuff, and I'm usually yelling at the screen, going, "No, that's completely wrong. That's exactly <laughs> not why I did that." Uh, but you guys were right more often than not. So I'm I was very I've been very impressed. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. And we have a big guest in the house today, Mike Mignola, man. Like, drop some of the bibliography and let's just launch into things. Rocket Raccoon, Cosmic Odyssey, Batman Gotham by Gaslight, Wolverine Jungle Adventure. But we are here because of Hellboy. Hellboy yeah. is probably the first thing everybody knows and thinks of whenever they hear the name Mike Mignola. And with good reason, um, you know, BPRD, Amazing Screw on Head, a lot has come out of the Hellboy universe. But uh, an artist artist, except for the fact that he's also hugely successful as a comic book artist, something that doesn't always go hand in hand with right. artists, yeah. artists. Yeah. Uh, what an honor and a pleasure to be talking with you, Mike Mignola. Off the top of the bat, man, first off, got to thank Uncle Jeff Darrow, man, who's who's in route back to France for uh, hooking us up uh, with you, Mike. Uh, that was Super. Jeff, Jeff literally wasn't going to leave me alone unless I talked to you guys. <laughs> and, and, Whatever Jeff, and Jeff's endorsements are rare. So uh, that speaks volumes. Uncle Jeff, the, the, the check is in the mail. Uh, so here's here's the opener, Mike, uh, because I couldn't find this in the Emily Post etiquette book anywhere. I'm, I'm sitting in a the theater and I'm being flanked by uh, George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola when I'm trying to watch uh, some Bram Stoker Dracula. Nature calls. Which one of those guys is getting up, man, and getting disturbed when when you uh you know have to make a break for for a minute? Well, neither of them got up, uh, <laughs> but I did. It is probably the most surreal moment in my life where you go, the guy who made Star Wars or the guy who made The Godfather. Which one do you ask where the bathroom is? But it was Francis's place, and Francis was a lot easier to talk to. So I, I, I'm sure I asked, I, I know I asked Francis. He seems like the better host, you know? <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a very good, yes, he was a very good host. Um, he poured the wine, he made the coffee. It was pretty, pretty darn cool. I'm afraid that that was the most interesting night of my life and it <laughs> Not downhill, but it's been a steady great. It's it's never it's never been there again. Lateral movement is quite okay, man. Uh, if it's Francis Ford Coppola and stuff, and Guillermo, I know you're watching. Don't take offense to what uh, Mike just said, man. Like, uh, you you're definitely. Yeah, on I, I take I take Del Toro for granted a little because there was so many years of Del Toro, um, and you know that's it's a it's just a. I don't think he'd be offended. Well, since you bring up uh, Dracula, Ed, maybe we'll stay on that for a minute. Dracula was um, felt like a book, that adaptation that you drew, felt like a book where you really start to plug in like your black spotting and, and in a way take your art to the next level. And I wonder a, a little bit about your reaction to that book. I've read that Dracula is, you know, growing up was like this turning point novel for you when you're 12 or 13 and you read Bram Stoker's Dracula was getting that adaptation something you lobbied for? Was that a dream project? What do you remember from, from the Dracula adaptation? I, you know, I, I didn't lobby for it. They, it, was, it was really simple. I mean, I don't know if they ever asked anybody else. They, I got the phone call out of the blue. Uh, Tops, I think, was just, this was their first comic. And I don't know who recommended me for it. Um, and I guess I was between jobs. And I said, yeah, okay, that, that, and I knew movie adaptations were notoriously horrible to do because you're kind of guessing at what the movie's supposed to be like, but still you have to make the studio happy. So, you know, I've heard the horror stories of you didn't draw that right. And you go, yeah, except I have no idea what it's supposed to look like. Um, my experience was totally different. I mean, they gave me so much access to stuff. It was 
phenomenal. Um, but I do remember that the publisher had no idea who I was because when they announced the book at a convention, he called me up and said, um, wow, you know, we announced you were doing this book and people knew who you were. <laughs> And I remember saying to the publisher, maybe you shouldn't talk to the artist anymore. <laughs> you need an editor. You need somebody uh, who's you know, can at least pretend to know shit. Um, but no, it was it was a it was a great experience. I do think, for whatever reason, um, there's an evolution in my work there. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It was a natural evolution over a, a several books, but. Um, um, I, I think the inker, who was really, really good, if I had inked that myself, you would see almost the completely Hellboy version of me. Um, the only thing I would say about the inking job, and it's, it's very common with people inking my stuff, he made my stuff very sharp and very, he made my blacks really flat. Um, which I know you guys have commented on the way I, I, I lay in solid black. So there's a little bit, even though my stuff's really graphic, there's an organic quality to my inking, which wasn't there in Dracula. Um, but I guess my composition, my storytelling, all that stuff was, was pretty much there. Let's talk storytelling real quick uh, in relation to that uh, comic and Francis Ford Coppola specifically, because you did get some FaceTime with the guy. And uh, there's an embarrassment of riches on YouTube where you could go down a Francis Ford Coppola rabbit hole. And he has fascinating stuff to say about storytelling. And I wonder if you guys got into any of those conversations when, when you visited Zoetrope or any of that. No. Um, no. I mean, the, the closer we came to storytelling was um, when he called me that the, the, morning after that dinner uh and asked me if i you know if i had an idea how to do this opening scene that george had suggested and um god i tell you man that felt like a long phone conversation because i you know i said yeah i do have an idea i mean there's there's that's why i realized there's two different parts of your brain that can be working simultaneously because i was actually watching because the, the night was so crazy that dinner I had with those guys was so insane that I went home and I was watching the next morning. I was watching the documentary about making Apocalypse Now, which I think is better than Apocalypse Now or as good. Uh, so I'm watching that documentary and the phone rings and it's him. So on one hand, I can watch him make Apocalypse Now while I'm talking to him, which is weird. Um, and he says, well, do you have an idea for how to do this scene? And there's a part of your brain that says, he made the Godfather, look, he's making Apocalypse Now, uh, shut up. And there's another part of you that's just working. And you go, well, yeah, I do have an idea. And my idea was based on a scene or inspired by a scene in an old um, Charlton Heston movie, El Cid, which is a, a, a movie I love. And I said, well, do you remember this movie? And he's like, eh, kind of, maybe, sort of. And I said, oh, there's this whole scene that takes place in a barn. And I did, I'm sure, my act amazingly terrible imitations of Charlton Heston and Sophia Loren. Um, and it's this romantic scene in a barn. And it's all like, oh, no, you know, we're going to go away. And no one will ever know who I am. And he opens the barn doors. And the entire Spanish army is out there chanting El Cid. And... Um, you know, and Sophia Loren's like, you know, why? And he's like, for Spain. And, and uh, so I told him all that. And of course, when you're telling something like that, it feels like it goes on for 45 minutes. And he's just like silent. And he goes, yeah, okay, can you draw that? And I went, yeah, okay. And, and so that was it. I mean, I, I had no, there was no conversation about, you know, you're really good at this, you could do this. It was just out of the blue. I don't know why he's asking me to come up with these scenes. So I, I did that scene and a couple other things. They asked me to, at one point I got a call, not from him, I think probably from Roman Coppola. It was a really weird call um, where he said, we're thinking of changing the ending of the movie. Do you have an idea for an ending where uh, the Winona Ryder character dies? And, I, and that one I'm really proud of. I really thought it was a, that was a very cool ending. Um, <clears throat> that didn't come out of the George conversation. George's conversation was, she's got to cut his head off. 
originally she didn't cut his head off. So I did draw a scene where she chopped his head off with a shovel because, which not very romantic, but uh, maybe that was my statement on not agreeing with George on that one, because, you know, she's, he's got a knife in him. And I'm thinking because of all the comic book Dracula things, if you take the knife out, he'll come back to life. So I thought, well, what's she going to chop his head off with? And that was the room where the gypsies had been filling boxes full of dirt. So I said, well, there's a shovel there. <laughs> so I tried to do a romantic version where she chops his head off with a ch shovel. Probably just as well they didn't use that. Um, but I did come up with this ending uh, later, or I can't remember when it was, uh, probably later, where I thought it was really cool that she, you know, Dracula dies in her arms and then Keanu Reeves comes in and when he opens the door, the wind kind of blows into the room and both of them just kind of disperse into like dust. And, you know, you see that Dracula is in his red suit of armor and the Winona Ryder character is in the dress she wore when she was Elizabeth at the opening of the movie. I thought it was a really nice circular thing and they now they're dead together. I think part of the problem was there wasn't a lot of chemistry uh, between Winona Ryder and Keanu Reeves. I think a lot of people have pointed that out. And I think after there was so much charisma to Dracula, the idea of her going off with Keanu Reeves at the end, people are gonna be like, mm, nah, I don't really wanna see that. Uh, in fact, there was a scene where they walk off together, which eventually got cut. Um, so yeah, the idea of this, this, the two of them being together in death, I thought was actually very, very cool. But anyway, that's, that's Dracula. Mike, you've, uh, you, you, you talk a lot about movies, um, you know, not just movies that you've worked on, but also I think movies and maybe how, how they influence you or a love of your life kind of thing. I wondered when you were younger and you were deciding to become a comic book artist, you grow up in California. Did you consider being a filmmaker? Was that something that you, you thought about comics versus film as, as far as something for you to do and you chose comics? Um, no, I mean, because I'm from Northern California. So if I was in Southern California, it might be different because I, maybe I would have known people in the movie business. But you know, the way I grew up, um, I had no contact with anybody who made movies. I think it's very common for people who aren't in LA or in that, you know, any part of that business, you kind of assume that movies are made in some parallel dimension and you will never ever encounter anybody who actually works in that business. So, um, so no, it, it never, never occurred to me. Let's let's talk about uh, North uh, California. Grew up in like Oakland, Berkeley area yeah. uh, specifically. And uh, being born in 1960, uh, you must have been growing up at a time when guys like, you know, Bud Plant and Gary Arlington, these are like the early comic shops are springing up kind of, you know, in your neck of the woods. Do you have experience with those those places when you were growing up? Is that how you got your comics? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I bought my comics at the local, you know, uh, 7-Eleven kind of place. Um, but then one day a friend of my father's said, there's a comic book store down on Broadway. And it was really far. And I mean, we were, my brothers and I were relatively young. And I think we kind of, I don't know, we got a map and we figured out where it was. And it seemed like it took like an hour and a half to walk there. Uh, and it was into like downtown Oakland, which started, just started getting a little dicey, you know? Um, and we found this place called, it was, I think it was called Graphic Comics and Collectibles. And I don't know if that was in any way related to like Bob Beer Bomb, who had stores in Berkeley. Um, I'm not exactly, I, all those guys were connected in some way, but you know, we stumbled in this place and it was like, oh my God, I didn't think there could ever be such a thing. So I distinctly remember the first time we walked into that place. And, and yeah, and then that, that started our adventures into uh, exploring what was around us, you know? So that eventually we, we would go into Berkeley and there were comic shops in Berkeley and all the used bookstores. So that was my real education. My brothers and I would spend all day on a Saturday um, hitting the comic shops, hitting the used bookstores. Uh, and then there was a great art house theater um, 
uh, the UC Theater in Berkeley that had a double feature every night, different double feature every night. So that's when we saw all the like the German films and the old silent films and all that stuff. So, you know, there's a few years there that were, you know, a gigantic education. Man, that sounds like a good day, a, a good way to spend a, uh, I, I would take that now, by the yeah, way. Yeah, sadly, the UC Theater, I, I was in, we were, I was on the first Hellboy movie and we were in Prague and one night I'm sitting at the bar with uh, uh, one of the film guys and it turned out we had gone to the same art school and I mentioned that whole experience of spending the day in Berkeley and ended up at the UC Theater and he said, oh no, the UC Theater has gone. And there was a part of me, even though I wasn't going to live in Berkeley, there was a part of me I realized that had this fantasy of someday I would live in Berkeley and, and, and kind of, you know, it'd be like those days. And as soon as he said the UC Theater was gone, that little that little dream just went up in a you know, puff of smoke. I was like, oh, it's, those days are really over. When, when you were watching those movies, was one of them the Fritz Lang, Ring of the Nibelungen, Siegfried movie? No, but I, I've seen it since. I saw it on DVD. Um, but um, yeah, that would be a long one to sit through in the theater. That's sure, like yeah. <laughs> gazillion hours long. Yeah, I was just thinking, because when you brought up like watching the, those old like black, like, that that one it it feels like that one resonates with your work. I, I don't know if you you see that. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's it's not a film. I, again, I think I've only seen it once, and I'm not even sure I saw the whole thing. I certainly saw the first half with the dragon. Yeah. Um, a lot of those images I just saw in like old books. Um, but I think there's there's a sensibility with a lot of those old German films that I have in common with them. I don't know if it came from those things. I think for the most part, I saw all that stuff later. Um, but, you know, I don't know exactly where that look came from. I can't <laughs> pinpoint it. It's, it's interesting to see, like, uh, I, I saw a description of your art style as being like German expressionist film and Kirby. <laughs> and it's interesting to see how people interpret the work later, you know, that it, it's not necessarily the formative influences, but something that people see as they're trying to describe it uh, later on. Yeah, it's, it's funny. A lot of people have, 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 you know, cited like Alex Toth as a big influence. And I got to say, I didn't know his stuff at all. Um, when I showed my work to Frazetta, which is another one of those crazy, holy fuck, I never thought I'd be here. Um, I showed him Hellboy and I was going on and on about how he was my biggest influence. And he said, uh, I don't see me, I see Toth. And I'd like to think he was saying that as a compliment, uh, though you never know with Frazetta. I never heard him say nice things about too many people. Um, but um, it was cool. I mean, it was a great moment for me because it meant he was actually looking at the stuff. But Toth was just not somebody I saw in those years where I was trying to absorb all these different people. I went through so many... You know, I, I was you know, trying to be presented for years. I tried to be Bernie Wrightson for years. And then I went through this phase where I wanted to be somebody different like every two days. And I tried, it's like I tried on so many different hats, you know, uh, to find the one that fit. And, and I learned something from most of those guys. And it was just, you know, when you started working, that's when your brain started trying to stitch all that shit together. And, and so, you know, the thing I guess I'm proud of is because I wasn't just influenced by any one guy, um, a lot of people look at myself and they, they can't spot the influence. You can, you know, there's a lot of guys out there, you go, oh, you were clearly into this guy, you were clearly into that guy. Um, I look at my stuff now, or, well, I can't tell, but um, yeah, I think maybe sometimes you can see a little bit of Kirby in there. Maybe you can see a lot of people can spot the Frazetta kind of composition things, yeah. but um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's made of a whole lot of, a lot of shit. It's made of a lot of influences and then it's made of a lot of hours of trying to figure that shit out. One of the Frazetta pieces that I see in your work is the uh, like the foreground, middle ground background. I think both of you are very strong at creating that depth. Um, and, you know, having heard you talk about Frazetta, I look at your work and think, where's the Frazetta? What do I see? And then looking at Frazetta, I see that kind of like the, certainly the three layers of depth being very clear and pronounced. And it blows my mind sometimes when I see your black and white art and can see like three layers of depth because it's two colors. Yeah. How do you get three out of black and white? Strong shapes, really strong compositions, like 
text. Yeah, well, stuff. I got so much of that stuff from painters. You know, I studied uh, like even with Frazetta, I never really studied his black and white stuff. I studied his paintings and tried to break them down into black and white patterns because his black and white stuff, even in the paintings, his black and white stuff is so strong and his his compositions are so strong, which is, I mean, one of the criticisms I got early on from one of the writers I work with is um, as a storyteller, I was trying to make every panel into a Rosetta painting as opposed to just doing character, you know, um, and I think still my strongest stuff is in is in certain images you know i'll do like people talking or moving back and forth um but there's always a set i'm always trying to make it work as an overall design for the page as opposed to just oh in this panel the thing is eating pancakes and you know the human torch reacts in some way you know you look at a lot of the kirby stuff and it's just wonderful storytelling but it's not it's not necessarily a great page design and i've always had i guess i've got a graphic you know, a graphic designer sensibility part of me that's trying to make the whole thing into one, even though it's a bunch of panels, making one big strong image out of that page. Mike, how cool was it, man, getting uh, Richard Corbin's take on on Hellboy, and how did that come about, come about? That I um, yeah, that's again one of those like holy shit, never thought that would happen. Um, there's a uh, a guy who is friends with Richard who was also a fan of my work. And I guess at some point he gave Richard, it's been a long time ago now, but he gave Richard, I think the Art of Hellboy book. And I think I got an email from Richard Corbin saying that he liked the stuff. And uh, you know, so I wrote kind of a fan letter back to him saying, you know, well, if you ever wanted to draw Hellboy and uh, he, his response was something like, that might be interesting. And I guess I just pushed it a little bit further and said, well, yeah, if you're interested, why don't we do that? So it's not a, it's not really a magic story, but it was just one of those things you never in a million years thought you would have contact with that guy. Um, I mean, so, so few people do. I mean, Richard is, it, it was such a hermit and so, so few people ever even spoke to him, let alone, you know, eventually I went to his house, which was just crazy. Um, I mean, not crazy as in a like weird thing, but it was just like, oh, I can't believe I'm actually hanging out with Richard Corbin. Um, yeah, it was really just, and, and what he did was so Great. I mean, the first thing we did together of uh, Macoma was cool and it was interesting. Um, it was always very strange writing for Richard because you never knew what you would get. Um, he would do exactly what you asked for, but sometimes you thought you were asking for something creepy and he would make it funny. And sometimes he'd, he'd say, well, then this will be a funny moment, but he'd make it creepy. So you never, you knew he would do the job, but you never knew how it would lean. Um, and then I don't know if it was right after Macoma that I, you know, when Richard liked working on my stuff, uh, I wrote The Crooked Man specifically for him. It wasn't a story that I'd had rattling around, but I thought, man, if there was any, ever anybody who could draw this kind of thing. And to this day, it's the, I think it's the one Hellboy story that's really creepy. Uh, I think it's still my favorite of the stuff that, all the stuff I've done, I think. I'm glad to hear you, uh, you know, that you wrote that for him, um, because I was going to ask about, you know, you've worked with some amazing artists. And uh, and I wondered about that. If you write to them, if you think like this is what Kevin Nolan's good at, let me put this in here or, you know, how that process works. Do you typically cater your stories to the artists that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of times I'll have like ideas banging around and they'll just kind of be sitting in my head. A lot of the time it's like, I'm going to draw this. And then, you know, because I kind of gotten out of the habit, um, those stories that I was going to draw myself kind of get stuck in the back of my head. And I go, well, when the right artist comes along, I know I've got at least one short story that I really love and I haven't yet found the exact right artist for it. Um, but mostly, mostly, I write 
specific to the artist. I mean, Kevin Nolan and I were talking and I said, you should do a Hellboy story. And he was like, well, yeah, maybe. And I went, ah, oh, cows and pigs. No one does better cows and pigs than Kevin Nolan. So I'll write him a cow and pig story or a story that has cows and pigs in it. Um, Duncan Fagredo's book, the big three book thing, that was something I would very much, I'd made up the story. Um, so it wasn't written for Kevin, in, or uh, for, for Duncan. Um, in fact, actually another artist was supposed to draw it. Another artist actually did draw the first issue that we had to scrap when the guy, you know, left the project. Um, but so that was one that it just existed as a story. And I don't know, I think as that, as that series went on and I knew Duncan was drawing it, there, there may have been some things that I, I leaned into because I knew Duncan, well, because Duncan could draw anything. I mean, with my stuff, when I write for myself, I write around a lot of things. Well, I don't want to draw that. I don't want to draw that. But you're working with a guy like Duncan Fagredo who can literally draw the shit out of anything. And that's so liberating. You know, I can ask for anything. I have Hellboy. Hellboy had a girlfriend. Hellboy rode in a car. Um, I, that would never happen if I was drawing the thing myself. So, um, yeah, I've been very lucky. I, there's a book uh, I can't talk about. But let's just say there's a possibility that Duncan and I will be working together again. And in which case, I would definitely write to him. Um, even if the plot is something that was rattling around in my head, when I write for other artists, I know what I have to, you know, artists I've worked with before, I know what I have to hit in the plot. You know, there's certain things you go, well, this guy's going to know how to do this, or um, I know the guy has this kind of a tendency to lean into this thing or that thing. So you, 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 you learn how to write for certain people. I, I certainly, I, I, you know, there's a couple of new artists I've worked with recently that are fun to work with, but there's something that's so much easier about working with a guy you've worked with before. Same like, like having Dave Stewart color my stuff, you know, it's just you, at this point we work together so long that I'll say, give me that night sky kind of orange thing you do, or that non-color splash kind of eggshell background thing you do you know it, we just have a shorthand for stuff and it's the same with you know writing for an, an artist that you've worked with for a long time let's talk about color for for a little bit because the the color has uh, been been strong in your work for for a really long time and i remember reading that you had you had some hand in that uh early on I, was that even in the days with uh, mark chiarello i hope i'm saying his name properly but that's yeah. really when i started noticing the color in a big way yeah, um, I mean, Mark and I had been friends for a long time, and he used to color covers up at Marvel uh, one day a week. And I would go up and sit with him. We would just hang out. And um, so I learned a lot about color from Mark and watching him do stuff. And I still think Mark is one of the best guys graphically. His use of color is spectacular and very graphical, very different than Dave Stewart, very graphic. He would use a color from column A and a color from column Z. And he knew exactly, you put those two colors together and bang, something amazingly graphic happens. Um, Dave is a little bit more realistic. Um, certainly much more like I would say organic. Um, but, you know, so I mean, because I knew Mark, he was natural to, to start Hellboy. And I think for the most part, I let him do, I don't remember specifically a lot of the conversations we had about color. I wasn't as hands-on as I am, you know, now, but I do remember there was one page I had him redo because I said, the entire comic is going to build to a big fire. So I want you as much as possible to save yellow for the end. So we get through four issues, we suddenly have a big yellow climax to this book. Um, and there was a, a, a splash page to one issue and there was all this magic energy blowing around. And I said, um, any color but yellow for that because we're saving yellow. And we colored the scene, all the energy was yellow. And it worked graphically really beautifully because the background was blue and then this thing was all yellow. And I said, you know, yeah, I, it, 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 it's very pretty, 
but it doesn't tell the story, you know? So that, that was the one place I think I, I, the only place I ever asked him to change anything. Uh, and that's when I realized that so much of what I do storytelling wise is in the color. Um, I don't know if I thought this way then, but certainly since then, when I plot a story, I'm plotting it with color in mind. So, you know, color is not one of those, you know, just do whatever. Um, uh, it's so, it's so important. I always say it's kind of like laying in a soundtrack, you know, all the stuff is there, but if you want, you know, the music to be sad and then you want it to build to action, you know, you can do that with color. There's so many places where I'm working with Dave Stewart where I said, this is quiet, this is sad. And then we pick up a little bit of energy here and then a little bit more energy here and then knock it back down and then boom, you know, that's how the color works. Plus there's specifics of, you know, two guys fighting with magic and this guy's, we key this guy's magic to this color. We key this other guy's magic to that particular color. Um, you know, so it's that kind of stuff. I, a lot of people, I think, think, a lot of people will say they'd like to see my stuff in black and white, which is fine, which is cool. But when it comes to comics, um, I think my stuff in black and white is only half there. Um, I'm kind of at a loss, you know, if I don't have that extra layer of storytelling to put in. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that transition from you know, working at places like, you know, Marvel and DC to like doing creator own stuff like that. That's kind of where you like would inevitably end up. Um, if, if, you know, you are sort of thinking at, in like the big picture, as opposed to just, you know, sort of doing like, you know, the, the assigned portion of work, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's strange to think back all those years working on Marvel and DC stuff. And for the most part, I had no hand in who was coloring my stuff. I had uh, almost no contact with the people coloring my stuff. I mean, I think it changed a little bit towards the end, but it's not a great place uh, if you want to have control over your work. You, you just you, you just can't. Um, so yeah, it, it's you know when I you know it's not the reason necessarily that I did my creator own book, but once I realized I had that much control, um, you know you you know. You, you get used to it and then you're too spoiled. You can never go back. So even, even on the rare occasions when I do uh, a cover for somebody or illustrations for some job or something, um, I will always say, you know, I'll do it, but you have to get Dave Stewart to color my stuff. You, you know, I can't, I can't go back to that. Yeah. Just whoever. Um, no, I need, I, you know, Dave is like my other right hand. Let's go back to the era where a young Mike Mignola breaking into the game as, a, as an anchor. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what was the impetus for that? Uh, was it still trying to get the pencil and chops up? Was it, you know, easy money? No, well, it wasn't easy money. Um, I never had any confidence in my drawing ability. Um, it's, it's, there were a couple different things going on in my head. So, you know, because I was so influenced by uh, painters, I, I wanted to do covers. I wanted to do pinups. I wanted to do that kind of single image stuff. Um, but I knew there was no way I could make a living doing that or even break in doing that. I just didn't think I was good enough. Um, so my plan was I'll go in as an inker because any chimp can ink stuff, right? I, I start, I started out as an inker. I can yeah. confirm the chimp part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it turns out I, it, it was a shitload harder than I thought it was. And I was, I was bad at it. <laughs> uh, but my plan had been, I'll move to New York. I'll be an anchor. Um, I will be in the business. And then little by little, I'll be in a position where they can throw me a Conan pinup or I can do some covers or, you know, my, my plan was before I died, I wanted to do like a 10 page Conan style backup feature in something so I could on my deathbed be able to say I drew a comic but it was I never really imagined that was just something that was just a box to check it never I, I had no 
urgent desire to draw comics. I just wanted to draw monsters. I wanted to be in that business. Um, so it wasn't like I have a big urge to, to draw comics. It just turned out I was terrible at being an inker. And uh, my first editor, Al Milgram, when he you know saw my stuff, he was like, well, you should draw. And I'm like, eh, yeah, eh, nah, Al, I'll just, I'll just ink. Uh, and then he came back to me a year later and said, you know, you're not very good at it. And I noticed your inking career is pretty much over. Uh, do you want to try drawing comics now? And I'm like, yes, please, because I have no skills at all. So I, uh, I, I went into drawing comics because I was too bad at being an inker. I was bad at drawing comics too, but you know, at least that one, eventually I started to figure out how to do it. You're sort of coming up in that era when, when the studio book came out with Wrights and Kaluta and those guys and, and, uh, and the, you know, Bernie Wrights and the look back, like they're doing these portfolios and these single image things. Is, is, is that That's what I wanted to be? I wanted to be those guys. Uh, a, a, a lot of my generation wanted to be those guys. That that look back book, well, the studio book was gigantic. And then the look back book was just, that confirmed me wanting to be Bernie Wrightson. Um, I, I, I think I co copied that book cover to cover. I, I thought comics will be my gateway into doing that kind of illustration, single image kind of stuff. Uh, it's weird. He's like, yeah, on one hand, I had absolutely no confidence in my ability, but I also wanted to be one of those guys. So I don't know how those two sides of my brain, you know. Do you have some sense of how the, the model of that stuff worked? Because like, I'll look at the old Pacific comics and see these portfolios and things. But then you hear about, you know, Barry Windsor Smith talking about, uh, you know, his gore blimey press stuff like these these portfolios weren't weren't moving. Like, so it doesn't sound like it was a, a, a way to make a strong living or anything like do you, yeah. do you i never really thought about money you know i never thought i would have a wife or kids or a house or anything like that i figured i would live in a a, a little studio apartment someplace and uh you know be able to support myself which again if you hear the stories about bernie and Kalud and all those guys that's how they lived for years you know they had their little tiny apartments and you know they you know the the stories i would hear with things like they'd spend a week doing a cover, you know, and they'd come into the office having spent a week doing this beautiful cover. And one of the old guys would take him aside and say, dude, you're making us look bad because I got to bang a cover out in six hours and you're taking a fucking week to do it, you know, because the guy who's got to bang it out in an hour has a big house in Connecticut with, you know, six kids and, you know, Bernie and Kaluta are living in the same shitty apartment building, uh, you know, someplace being artists. So uh, I always had in mind much more being that kind of guy, you know, take the time, do really nice work. Hopefully once I figured out what I was doing, um, but never occurred to me, I would, you know, make, make any money in comics. There wasn't a lot in, in those days to make you think, oh, comics is where you go to make money. It, that, that all happened much later. Did you recognize like style as being vital to your success early on? Because your style is so different than, virtually anybody in comics and you know was that conscious that you should look different that way you're more valuable not really i mean i just drew the way i could draw i couldn't draw in any kind of a commercial style i mean that was part of the problem with you know when i started drawing comics with people said you know what do we do with the guy he doesn't draw like a superhero artist um i i feel like i didn't have a lot of control over the way i drew and certainly once I sort of relaxed into drawing comics and started having fun drawing comics, then I was just drawing the way I wanted to draw. And it was a slow evolution. So there, there was no part where I said, oh, I need to invent a style. You know, I think your style finds you. Um, and I remember towards the end uh, of those, you know, Marvel DC years, um, I started really being comfortable with what I was doing. And I started having editors go, eh, this stuff's getting a little, a little out there. I remember there was one Cosmic Odyssey cover. And I don't remember if I actually had to redraw something or if just the editor went, um, dark side, you made him look like a refrigerator. I'm like, well, the guy looks like he's made of cement. 
I, I can't see giving him like regular muscles and stuff. And there was a, a issue of Superman, right? A really big guy carrying somebody under his arm. And I remember the editor going, that, that guy's, his proportions are pretty odd. I'm like, well, yeah, because he's this big, giant, weird looking guy. So I made him a big, giant, weird looking guy. Um, so I was starting to get a little bit of a little bit of resistance or a little bit of warning that my stuff was starting to go someplace. Um, but I mean, you mentioned that, that um, artist artist thing. Yeah, I, I figure that's where I would be. And it's a very flattering thing to have other artists really like your stuff. But other than drawing Batman, for the most part, my, the response to my work was, um, please don't draw the characters we like because we hate the way you do almost everything. Batman, okay, <laughs> fine. You finally found one character that you can draw. But um, I, I just wasn't the right artist for so many, so many characters. So, you know, it, it, uh, Batman, like I said, that, that seemed to work, but, you know, I never gave a shit about Batman. So um, I never had that, that burning desire a lot of people seem to have to just draw Batman forever. Um, so um, yeah, it, it all changed when I made up a guy where nobody could say, oh, I liked it better when this other guy drew it, um, which, which has happened now. Now people will go, yeah, yeah, you know, if, if you can't get Duncan for Grado, I guess maybe we'll tolerate Mike Mignola drawing his own characters. But um, yeah, it's, at least at the beginning, nobody, nobody could say that I was the third best Hellboy artist. It's interesting to me that you cite like Cosmic Odyssey as, you know, as an example where this would come up because that's another book I look at in your, you know, in your bibliography and think like, that's a turning point. You know, like it feels like you figured out something in Cosmic Odyssey and it's interesting that an editor sees it and goes too far. You've gone too far. <laughs> Meanwhile, I feel like that's going in the direction, you know, making you, you. And yeah, uh, I, was, I, I, would... I was much farther down the road to being me than you can actually see in that book because the inker, nothing against him, but he was the wrong guy to ink my stuff. Carlos goes on, great guy in that Al Williamson school of inking, um, but not a graphic guy. And my stuff had started to get really graphic and it was really like big, bold shapes. And Carlos, you know, when I would do something with four lines, he would add 10 extra lines to it. And it, it started, it just, it softened the stuff. Um, yeah. Um, so I was starting to figure out what I was doing and I, and I added Kirby to my mix, which, which was a huge thing. So even though I grew up like reading Kirby comics, I loved the characters, but I'd never really looked at Jack's artwork as, as an influence, but spending a year with Kirby stuff, using it for reference, I just realized the power and the dynamic stuff. And you know, because I was still trying to be kind of a pretty picture guy. And 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 I think Kirby gave me license to to be much bolder and much more expressive and spend less time figuring out the muscles and a leg, you know, and just and it was just powerful shapes and abstract shapes. So so it wasn't it wasn't Dracula. It wasn't Cosmic Odyssey, like where do you see your turning point being? What 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 was like sort of the where you were like, hey, I'm on to something now? There was, I mean, there's a couple. Uh, a lot of stuff happened in Fat for the Gray Mouser, uh, storytelling wise. Um, How did you like Al Williamson's ink on on your work on that book? You know, I liked. I thought it was it was it was it was great for the book. Uh, for that for that story um, again it softened the graphics but Al there's a wonderful kind of graphic thing that Al did he's he was a great designer with ink so I, I even know how to explain it there's some guys they do the Al Williamson kind of stuff and it's 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 mushy but there was a graphic thing that Al did, I'm sure unconsciously, a lot of stuff with parallel lines and stuff. There was just a wonderful um, uh, thing, this, this thing that you can't put your finger on that, that Al, Al brought to stuff. Um, so he didn't, 
he added something to my work, but he did, he added more than he subtracted. And I think Carlos Gazan subtracted more than he added. He added lines, but he didn't add them in a kind of interesting way. Um, so, plus I loved Al Williamson, so. I always think it's, um, I always think of like, who are the great anchors and stuff. And it's always unfair to include Al Williamson compared to everybody else because he's just such a great artist overall. It's almost like too much of an advantage if, if that's who you have to be compared against. I spent, I spent so many, so much time saying to Al, why don't you just draw comics? Why don't you just draw the stuff? But you made know. a lot of artists look better, you know, as an, as an, oh, yeah. he certainly John, brought a lot John Romita great. Jr. I, I was just an artist until Al inked his stuff. You know, it's just that 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 stretch they did together. I thought was just just genius. Yeah, we got to look at some. Al, Al, Al was fantastic, and one of the coolest guys I've ever gotten a chance to know. What did you think of uh, Kevin Nolan's inks on your Alien story? You know, I did. I had Kevin ink that so that Kevin would redraw my stuff, which is not something I would ordinarily want anybody to do, but I'm such a fan of Kevin's stuff. And I was so jealous when I would see him completely wipe out other guys' stuff and turn it into a Kevin <laughs> Nolan job. <laughs> totally. And I thought, this would be great. I will get Kevin to redraw my stuff. And he didn't redraw anything. <laughs> I was going to say, it's, it's, it's not as much Kevin Nolan as I'm used to seeing on a Kevin Nolan Inked, yeah, you know, uh, I mean, Ke Kevin, the way Kevin said it is, you know, well, there was nothing wrong, <laughs> which is a huge compliment, but still not what I was looking for. Um, there was one face. I remember there was going when the comic, you know, I got, I guess, got the inks and stuff. I was like, oh, there's one face. There's one girl face because girl's not my strong suit. But there was one face. There was a really cute Kevin Nolan girl face. And I went, oh, thank God, he redrew one face. And I went back and looked at the pencils and I had accidentally drawn a Kevin Nolan face <laughs> and he inked it. Um, but there was a, a, an old story that I had drawn, really old, a really early one um, for DC, this uh, Clayface, Origin of Clayface. And I was originally, I think originally I was going to ink it and then Kevin was going to ink it. And then the job just got you know, put on a shelf. And eventually the job came back. The story was that pages had actually gone to somebody else to use as inking samples. You know, however that worked, eventually these pages came back and they sent them to me and said, well, would you ink them? And it was, there was so many years between when I got the pages back and when I drawn them, I realized I'd have no idea how to ink that version of me. You know, it was so much stuff I would draw differently and I didn't want to redraw the whole job. So I said, let's get Kevin Nolan to ink it. And that job, Kevin did redraw a lot. <clears throat> so at least there's one job out there that's got spots that are me and spots that are clearly Kevin. It's a, it's a really odd mix. I'm taking a look at these uh, old comic reader back covers that you did uh, and very they're soft very mushy <laughs> you see the evolution that's what i love about your career like when you really sit down and take a look at everything you could see this, yeah. this evolution but uh, specifically in terms of color and things I, I wonder did you cut the color separations on on these back covers yourself i had no i had no idea that was stuff i just in in that's why I would just send drawings and I would never know if they were going to be used or not used. So I had no, I have no idea who colored that stuff. I knew nothing about it. I just sent him a drawing and I was thrilled if it got, you know, published. I love this, uh, this masters of Kung Fu joint with that one villain that has the two knife hands that oh, yeah. makes even every 10 year old wonder, well, how does he use the bathroom? <laughs> I never wondered. <laughs> you never had to be 10. In, yeah, in the should... movie, they just gave him one knife hand. Uh, that's, that's probably nice the best, yeah. Were you, uh, in your formative period, uh, were you a, uh, a, a Starlin guy when you were developing your comic book taste? Just, just asking in reference to then working with him on Cosmic Odyssey. Yeah, Jim, Jim was one of those guys. Um, I loved his stuff uh, as soon as I saw it. Uh, never, never thought of him as an influence or anything, except in his storytelling. There was a lot of really wonderful, subtle storytelling he did, um, sequential storytelling. I remember, I think it was the first issue he did of Warlock, which blew me away. And there's a three panel 
sequence of Warlock just turning his head. And I think every panel, he's saying one word. Um, and I just remember going, ding, oh, storytelling is exciting. It was not something I'd ever been in love with the idea of telling stories, but that was one that, one of those things that planted that seed about, oh, you can do things with storytelling. You can do things with sequential stuff. And I remember when I was inking other people, not that I was trying to, I certainly wasn't changing anything, but inking other people going, why aren't they as interesting as somebody like, like Starlin? You know, so I, I was at least aware of, Jim, I think is where I really became aware of storytelling and, and, and how you could move things around. Um, so yeah, I was just a huge fan of his stuff, uh, of the stories he was telling. So yeah, when Cosmic Odyssey came along, I, you know, I jumped at it, even though I couldn't give a shit about any of those DC characters. It was just a chance to work with Jim. And Jim did an interesting thing that I would do eventually for other artists. Um, he didn't thumbnail the story, but he sent page layouts. It basically just to say, this is a big panel. These are four panels in a row. And then here's a, this panel and here's a, that panel. So I just got a grid uh, that was so much about his storytelling, which is why his storytelling is style is so runs all through Cosmic Odyssey because the because Jim spe was very specific about it. I mean, to the point of stack this panel, but move the hand, stack the panel, but move the hand a little bit higher. There's a whole, and I don't think it really works. Um, there's a whole sequence where I think it's Green Lantern's going to shoot himself in the head. And it's just repeating almost the exact same Im image for like half the page or most of the page. It's just his hand moving the gun up to his head, something like that. Uh, I mean, he was dead on specific about, you know, what what that whole thing was supposed to be. I want to ask you about like the early 90s and your experience around the comics industry and what was going on then as like Image Comics is formed. Um, you know, there's a big speculator kind of bubble, it bursts. What do you remember from that early 90s time period? Maybe, uh, you know, coming into the formation of Legend and, and you working on Hellboy, like is stuff just swirling around? Like you tell me, what, what what's that look like early 90s comics from your perspective? I mean, it was weird. Um, I mean, I was in a good spot, you know, early nineties, I was, I was sitting in a pretty good spot at Marvel um, and just having a good time drawing mostly covers. Uh, I was actually lined up to do a couple X-Men projects. Uh, so I, that's at least what I think of for the nineties. Um, Hang, I was in New York. I was hanging out at Marvel. I knew all the guys at DC. It was just, it was a fun period. Um, my wife had a job. So, um, or girlfriend had a job. And uh, so I wasn't carrying the whole, and we lived together. So I wasn't carrying the whole burden of rent. Uh, I was making decent money because I was doing a lot of covers. Um, and it was just fun. Uh, there was no, there was nothing I wasn't looking at it business wise. I wasn't looking, I didn't care about how the business was going. As long as every time I walked into Marvel DC, somebody said, can you do a cover for this? I'd say, yeah, that'll be fun. And so I was just having fun. Um, when guys were suddenly making, you know, a million dollars, I was drawing things like Fat from the Grey Mouser and Iron Wolf, you know? So I was, I was the one guy not making a dime in comics, but I was, I was having fun. You must have made a couple of dollars on that X-Force comic. Because, because we are the children of the speculator boom, got to gotta mention that thing, man. Uh, I was there grabbing those Rob Liefeld comics religiously every 30 days, man. Got a, had a fresh one. And uh, then I pop up. Where did the, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, there was the little teaser ahead of time. There was a two-page spread uh, pinup. And it's like, interesting, interesting. And then... Uh, you know, there's a whole issue of, uh, of X-Force. And I mean, it, it's, do you hear about that comic uh, often at conventions, probably from people of our, our demographic? <laughs> I used to hear a lot about it. Uh, what I do hear is so many people saying, I hated it. And then years later, I learned to appreciate it. Which is really, in general, what I heard about my work a lot. It was I used to hate all I used to hate your stuff, and I always thought actually the best compliment I was ever going to get 
the, the best it was ever going to get was people saying, all my friends hate your stuff. I think it's just different. It's very important <laughs> to have that pause that I don't know how to say it. You're just different. And I figured, well, that's fine. Artist, artist, that's that's fine. Um, but yeah, that, that X-Force was a weird one because I remember sitting in, uh, I, I spent a lot of time hanging out in the, Mar- in the X-Men office and looking at Rob's stuff one day. And I said to the editor without ever trying to make a job out of it. I just said, you know, it'd be interesting to see somebody else work from Rob's labs. Cause Rob, for whatever else he had going on, his stuff was exciting. It was dynamic. Um, and I got a call a couple of days later, it seemed like from Bob Harris, the editor saying, would you want to try that? And I went, yeah, what the hell? You know, it's, that'd be fun, maybe easy. I don't know. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was fun. I had actually had a lot of fun doing it. Um, you couldn't find two artists more different than me and Rob, but, uh, and I, I do remember at one point asking Rob this opening sequence, the characters are running around. Uh, I said, where are they? Are they inside? Are they outside? He goes, Oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's you're not putting the kind of thought I would I would think you need to put into this stuff. Um, but it was, you know, it was it was it was fun. And boy, did people hate it. Um, I think it, it's it's almost like that that one issue of uh, New Mutants that uh, Kevin Nolan did that people supposedly tore it, tore it up and sent it back to to Marvel. Uh, they hated it so much. Um, I, Art Adams and I bought that entire issue, all the all the original art because we loved it so much and people hated it so much. Um, so yeah, it was just it was just a weird, fun experiment. And it led to me leaving Marvel because I was supposed to do the cover. And I walked in one day and there was the cover drawn by Rob after the editor had assured me over and over and over again, yeah, 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 I want you to do the cover, I want you to do the cover. And then image happened and Rob left. And I've told the story a million times, but I'll tell it again. Image left. And it, like, while that comic was going on, and I remember saying, you know, the, the editor going, you know, oh, Rob's gone, but that's fine. But, you know, he was very stressed about losing Jim Lee. And I said, it seemed like the, the, the you know, who cares about Rob word balloon was still hanging in the air. And I said, what about that cover? And he goes, well, I got to check with Rob. I'm like, Rob's gone. And I'm lined up to do a couple other X-Men projects, but you still have to check with Rob, even though he just left. So that kind of made me realize where, how important I was. Uh, and then when I walked in and there was the cover drawn by Rob after the editor kept kind of stringing me along. And I remember looking at that cover and, and, and saying, what's this? And he goes, oh yeah, I was gonna tell you about that. It's like, you weren't, except that I come in the office all the time. How did you think at some point I wasn't going to find out? You know, it is the cover on a comic I mostly drew. You know, at some point I was going to see the comic. Um, and I, I remember just being so stunned. Because uh, also I was, I was, at the time I was very friendly with that editor. And I just, I couldn't believe that this had happened. And it's not that big a deal in the scheme of things. Oh, somebody else drew the cover. But it was just, it was how it was handled. And I remember walking to another editor's office and sitting on the couch and saying, I cannot fucking believe this happened and telling him what happened. And that editor said, well, I guess you'll never work for us again. And I just remember being stunned. I, I never forget that. Uh, I think years later, I'm now thinking he may have meant and probably did mean, oh, you've been screwed over and now that's it. You'll never work for us again. But at the time I thought, I took it as, what are you complaining about? You know, uh, you're, you're, now you're too much trouble. Now we'll never work with you again. And I just, but I just remember being so stunned and, and very sheepishly picking up my portfolio and leaving and knowing I would never go back. And I was, there was a, a writer writing a project for me. You've probably seen this artwork floating around for this like Fantastic Four uh, X-Men 
thing. It had the thing. It was a, a teaser piece of art I had done of the thing. And I think Mr. Fantastic and Wolverine. It was going to be this very commercial one shot prestige format thing um, that uh, I think Larry Hama was writing. And uh, I said, if I, have, if I don't have the plot for that in the next 24 hours, then I'm out. Because I, I wanted to be professional enough that I wasn't saying, hey, I don't care about that plot. But I said, if the plot isn't written in the next day, I'm out. And 24 hours later, when that plot didn't show up, I said, that's it. I am out. And uh, that was that was it. And actually, and that led, I think, probably to Hellboy. Because I once I burned my bridge with Marvel, um, I was left with DC. And even though I was friends with everybody at DC and I could get work at DC, <clears throat> I didn't really know or care anything about those characters. So there was nothing I could get excited about. Um, and I think as a result, you know, my, my mind wandered and eventually led to Hellboy. Good for all of us. Yeah, I think that's kind of been- that Worked out good for me. <laughs> that's for yeah. that too, yeah. yes. Do you think that you would have walked out if that editor hadn't made the kind of that snide comment of like, oh, I guess you won't work for us anymore. Did that, did that kind of help push you I out think, the door? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I think it would have been hard to continue working with that editor. Like I said, I was, I was lined up to this X-Men Fantastic Four thing uh, for Bob Harris and you know the X-Men office. And then there was another X-Men project that was kind of floating around. That's weird, I can't really remember anything about it. But I think Art Adams and I were supposed to do some kind of X-Men book somewhere down the road. Um, I specifically remember I've got two projects lined up and you, and, and, and you pull this shit with this one cover, you know, that jeopardizes those two projects. Um, so I, I, I can't imagine once I lost the trust of that, you know, once I didn't trust that editor, I don't know how I would have been able to continue because up until then it was just fun it was do a we need a pinup of you know whatever you want you know just do that kind of stuff or do this funny weird rob liefeld thing it was all fun and games and once that made it not fun anymore because i had no affection for any of those characters i mean all those characters they're not characters i grew up with you so the six pack uh -huh. <laughs> It's yeah, I you know, but not even that. Like even Wolverine and 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 those other guys that had been around, those weren't my Marvel characters. So there was no affection. It's it's funny to look back now and think I, the Marvel comics that I grew up in, I grew up on, I drew almost none of that stuff. Uh, I did these two little Thor backup features that, when I look back, I think that's the only time I drew something that to me felt like Marvel comics. I got one of those Thor comics when, when I was a little kid, man. It's what it tells from tells Vasgard or whatever would be the Mignola backup feature. And there's a, there's a demon or two in there with that, with the horns knocked off with the little circles on the head. And that's where that came from. Kirby had done this uh, tales of Asgard, I think with these troll guys that had these knobs on their forehead and I just, I always liked those knobs. So, you know, when it came to Hellboy, I put those knobs on his head. Mike, that was like one of my first like five comics that I ever had my entire life. That that um, sort of like journey uh, where you're kind of like out of options, I guess, you know, that, 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 that you'd like, and then you kind of, you know, try, you know, creating your own thing. Um, that's like a very common thing where you're sort of like maybe forced to do something you wouldn't rather do. And then it becomes like your big success. Um, and then there's also the thing of like Hellboy, you, you almost like created that, that, that first Hellboy drawing as like, almost like a, like a goof uh, kind of, kind of reminds me of like the Ninja Turtles story, how they just, they came up with like their big, huge hit just by having some fun. So like, how do you get from that initial Hellboy drawing to like, you know, Hellboy as, as he appears in the comics? Well, I mean, um, like I said, it, it was just a, a fun thing I drew. And I think around that same time or after that, um, I remember doing sketches at conventions and people would just say, 
for whatever reason, everybody probably had a drawing of, by, of Batman by me already. They would just say, well, draw, draw whatever you want. <clears throat> and I would start drawing this character. <clears throat> there was no thought into who he was or doing anything serious. He was just made up, made up a bunch of shapes I liked. <clears throat> so there's a little bit of a transition to figuring out what this guy looks like. And then um, it really came down to, after I did this one Batman for DC, I was like, oh, I want to do this kind of story, but who's my main character? And I thought, I've been drawing this kind of thing for a couple of years for fun. What if that's my main character? Um, it, it really was just come up with something that you won't get bored drawing. You know what kind of stories you want to do, but you need, if it's a, if it's a regular guy, you're going to get bored with him. But you've already been drawing this guy having fun drawing him. So let's, let's do that. And we've only made up one name that we like. And it was just, again, just a joke. It was that in that first drawing, writing Hellboy on there, I thought that was hilarious. And I thought, well, that's the name. And this wonky looking lump of stuff with a tail is, is, the, is the character. So we'll just shoehorn that into this kind of supernatural Lovecraftian kind of stuff. And it worked. So, so that, because that first drawing is pretty famous and he looks like radically different from the finished form. So you're saying like out there floating around in various people's sketchbooks are like bit by bit evolutions into what he eventually became? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's that kind of famous um, dime press thing um, that where I was just, I was at a party in Italy and this artist who was like the Italian Mike Mignola, that he, Nicola Mari, he was, you know, he didn't speak any English. I don't speak any Italian. And we both drew our characters together. I think it was just one of those things. Somebody had a piece of paper and we both drew our characters and nobody ever asked me. Suddenly he got used for a cover of something. Um, uh, but that was, that's a real transitional Hellboy drawing because he's kind of starting to look more like a superhero kind of a thing. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, it came from that original drawing, but, but yeah, I did scale him down quite a bit. I added the hand at some point, um, but I didn't know what he was. I just liked him as a shape. I want to dig into like, like your writing and writing Hellboy and, and this whole arc. But I'm curious about Lovecraft. Do you remember how Lovecraft, how you first encountered Lovecraft and what impact that had on you? Yeah. Um, probably it was one of those old Marvel Conan magazines. That, you know, the, the early ones, they had a lot of, even before Savage Heart of Conan, there was, uh, what was it? Savage Tales, I guess. And it would have these big articles in the back all about um, Weird Tales magazine. And, and reading those kind of articles made me aware of Weird Tales and the other authors. So Lovecraft's name popped up in those kind of things. So as I, and I was so into Robert E. Howard, I read all that stuff. And when you read about that stuff, you read about that, that the Robert E. Howard and the Weird Tales, Lovecraft's name comes up a bunch. And so as I was, you know, kind of expanding out from Robert E. Howard, he was just one of those guys, you know, on those trips to Berkeley, I found all those, you know, uh, Lovecraft collections. And uh, yeah, it was, it was an eye opener, that, that gigantic cosmic thing. And I'm not the biggest Lovecraft fan. I haven't, I, I haven't read all the stuff. Um, He's not my favorite author, um, but it did Lovecraft and a lot of guys who kind of expanded on Lovecraft, a lot of guys from that Weird Tales period, 30, you know, 20s and 30s stuff, um, gave me a taste for that big cosmic horror kind of thing. So I, I, I wanted that in the Hellboy stuff. I wanted, you know, I didn't want to do the Necronomicon. I didn't want to, you know, do what a lot of other guys were doing where you tie this stuff really to that Lovecraft universe. But I wanted to create something, you know, so my, my book would have that kind of a background. I, I, there were, there was a lot of stuff 
I, I tried to take everything I like and stick it in Hellboy. And I think eventually I did. You know, I wanted World War II because of the Marvel characters, because of the Red Skull and Baron Zemo and Captain America. And so I wanted Hellboy to have his roots in World War II. I wanted that kind of big cosmic Lovecraftian world myth. But I also wanted to, like regional folklore and all that stuff. So um, somehow I managed to figure out a way to have all that shit work together, sort of. It's pretty remarkable, I think, how you contextualize Lovecraft within Hellboy. Like it's, 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 it's amazing. You talk about like other writers that expanded on Lovecraft in the 20s and 30s, but you know, like you're one of those other writers that has expanded on Lovecraft, uh, you know, in well, a really fascinating I don't, way. I don't think I, I, I think... I don't know that I expanded on Lovecraft because I, I stayed away from Lovecraft, but I created something that certainly owes a debt to Lovecraft. I, I do think um, one of the things I'm proud of in what I've done is I have uh, mentioned a lot of authors to people who maybe don't read that stuff. So I think I've steered a lot of people towards people like Lovecraft and, and, and a lot of all the much less well-known guys, uh, a lot of Victorian children, you know, Victorian ghost story writers and things like that. I've, I've tried to uh, always acknowledge the debt I owe to, to all these guys. I really like that you do that. Um, you know, we live in such an odd time where we can access all of that, but we often don't know what to look for. You know, it's such a service for you to share these things, these these writers or movies. Sometimes I see you post that. Oh, um, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I remember. Service. Well, there was a convention. Um, and, you know, I remember an artist coming up to me, a, a young guy, probably in his 20s. But he was an artist and he was asking me, he was looking at my portfolio and he was asking me about composition. And I said, well, I'll kind of, you know, it's all that pyramid for Zeta thing and the guy had no idea who Frazetta was and I couldn't believe there was an artist working in this business who literally had no idea who Frank Frazetta was and um I was like Conan Tarzan they, it just didn't register and I didn't know what to do and I finally said google him <laughs> and it just hit me the technology exactly what you said the technology exists to know about anything and everything but if you don't even know a name to look up, you, you miss it. And that was the same convention. It's funny because Bernie Wrightson you know, was at that show and I went over to Bernie and I said, this guy didn't know who Frazetta was. And Bernie said, that's part of our job is to keep these guys alive, you know, keep them out there to people. And that was the same convention. I started asking people if they'd seen Bride of Frankenstein and nobody had seen Bride of Frankenstein. And I think from then on, so much of my Facebook page has been here, especially in October, here are my favorite horror movies. Here are the five great ghost movies. Here's the six favorite vampire movies. Be, and, and every time I do it, somebody says, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. And I go, yeah, that's, that's my job then. It's actually cool that somebody on the internet actually admits that they didn't know about something <laughs> yeah, right. before. I was going to say though, now you're going to probably need to like adapt to TikTok or something like Facebook. Now we're, <laughs> we're phasing age out of that at, at some point. I think, I think I've hit my limit technology wise with, with Facebook. That's, that's uh, yeah. So um, I, I do want to get into some of your writing process. Uh, you know, you hit the ground running with Hellboy. We recently reread it for an episode of the show, and I was kind of amazed by how great it is from the get-go. Like, it feels like you had worked things out. Were you writing a lot before you get to Hellboy? Like, were you were, was writing a plan? Was that something that you were doing? Writing was entirely a dodge for me. Writing was, if I write my own stuff, I won't have to draw an airplane. Um, because <laughs> the only, there's, there's just, there's a, a, a fear, at least for me, when, a, because there's so many things I either didn't know how to draw, didn't want to draw, was too lazy to draw. Um, and when you get a script from another writer, you just go, oh God, oh God, oh God, are they going to ask me to do, you know, a guy driving a car? Are they, you know, there's just, it's, it's, it's a horrifying thing. Um, so part of the Hellboy thing, I mean, again, I'd done that Batman story that I plotted myself, 
which is Batman in a cemetery, falls into a grave and ends up in an old Victorian house fighting a monster. So you go, well, okay, that's just stitched together shit I want to draw anyway. Um, and then I was like, well, could I make a career out of that? <laughs> what am I thinking as I went along was I, I, I need to find a way to continue to be able to make a living doing the laziest shit I want to do. Um, so yeah, so coming off that Batman thing saying, well, let me make up more of these stories where I just draw what I want to draw. Um, my original idea with John Byrne, because again, I, 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 I had never written, uh, I'd plotted, I plotted a Hellraiser story, I plotted that Batman story. Um, and again, it was just stringing together shit I wanted to draw. And with John, when I asked him to, to write Hellboy with me, the original idea was I would just give him a list of shit I wanted to draw and let him stitch it together into a story. But once I came up with all the stuff I wanted to draw, there's just a part of my brain that kicked in that started connecting the bits. And this goes to this, 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 this. So by the time I sat down to actually draw Hellboy, um, I had stitched together a plot. And then I drew it. And John and I talked all the time. So I'm sure I was running all my ideas past John. So I drew it and then I realized, oh, but he won't know what's going on. So I wrote it, but I wrote it. It's kind of like writing with a, you know, uh, it was like the underpainting, right? So I wrote it knowing John would rewrite it. And I mean, I didn't write it completely, but you know, I, I put in most of the dialogue and stuff because John doesn't, I never wrote a plot, wrote out a plot. So the only thing John's got to work from is my notes. It's like when Kirby, you look at like Kirby pages where Jack's written basically the comic and then Stan just cleaned it up. Um, so that's what John did. And John knew I should be drawing, writing the comic myself knew I didn't have the confidence to do it. Uh, I think on your show, you guys read that thing that I'd forgotten about where at the end where John says basically, hey, he's gonna draw it himself. Um, and that's true. Um, I mean, by the end, I was actually editing what John was writing. John would write these gigantic paragraphs and I would just cross a couple of them out. It's like, ah, hey, you're over overdoing it. So by the end, it was very clear. I was starting to kind of at least edit John. And I remember there were a few places where John changed stuff and I went, and it would just be like changing one or two words. I went, kind of liked it better the way it was. Nothing against what John did, um, but I learned what I didn't want it to sound like. It was, you know, again, it was working with a safety net. And at some point you go, well, I guess you got to take the net away or, you know, I was in, in training wheels. You know, John was my training wheels. And then John said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving with the wheels, you know, so now you're on, you're on your own. Uh, so we didn't have any kind of falling out or anything. It was just, uh, okay, see, it's not magic. You can do it yourself. And then the first one I wrote myself was a nightmare because just, there's nothing about, yeah, it was like working without a net, you know, like, like, Jesus, it's, that's really what it's going to be. Just what I wrote. Nobody's going to come along and fix it. Oh shit. That was, that was rough. And then, was, the, and then the one after that was, I had fun. I relaxed and I had fun. And then I, you know, then it worked. Has your writing process evolved over time? Like, you know, sometimes you write with a partner, sometimes you write for another artist um, you know, what, what's it like now whenever you write a story? Well, I mean, it's, it's always different. Uh, well, certainly when I write with a partner, it usually means I've just talked to a guy on the phone and then he wrote it. Um, that's some, the way to do sometimes, it. Sometimes I have a lot of input. Sometimes like, you know, when so many, like those years when John Arcudi was doing BPRD, he would do like 30 issues, uh, based on, like one phone call where I said, and then some stuff happens. You know, there were there are always little bits here or there where I'd say, eventually we got to get from here to here to here to here to here, and we would bounce ideas back and forth. But um, John was one of those guys. The less I said, the better, as long as he knew we had to hit certain points. And other guys want a lot more 
feedback. Um, when I write myself, not for myself, but it's just me writing for somebody. Uh, one thing I have learned to do, even though I write plot style, it's almost full script. Um, so I will put in dialogue. I will be very specific in, in a lot of cases about what goes on on a page. I'll usually break it down into panels. Uh, close up on this, zoom in on this, blah, blah, blah. It's just so much of my storytelling is those mechanical, uh, you know, zoom in on an eyeball, and then we cut to this, you know, it, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Um, I've learned to put in most of the dialogue, even though, you know, it, it's, I'm lazy, right? I don't want to write a full script. I don't want to write the dialogue. But what I learned early on is I wouldn't put in any of the dialogue. This was drawing for myself. I wouldn't put in any of the dialogue. And then when it, I draw the comic and then I had to write it and I go, oh, I have no idea what's going on here. Um, it, it was fun to say, it's the classic example is the, the, the fight between Hellboy and Hecate in Wake the Devil because I just drew a fight scene and there were some close-ups and it was clearly they were saying things to each other, uh, but I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. And when it came to scripting that, I'm like, oh shit, I've got like six panels of them conversing with no idea what they're talking about. So, so all these prophecies roll out and that's how Hellblade became the beast of the apocalypse because literally I had no idea what the fuck they were saying to each other. So Hellblade became the beast of the apocalypse because I didn't write the script beforehand. So now, especially in any kind of dialogue heavy stuff, I write a good amount of the dialogue. And then the reason I would never write full script is I need to be able to interact with the artwork. So even though I've written maybe almost a full script, when I get the actual artwork from the artist, it's like, oh, but it doesn't look like he's saying that. It looks like he's saying this. Or, oh, this character back here looks like they need to have a line. So I, it's, it's just an organic thing of working from the artwork. Uh, I remember there's a kind of romantic moment in... Um, one of the Duncan McGrado Hellway things, Hellway saying goodbye to this girlfriend. And I was so nervous about how to write it. And Duncan did such a beautiful job with the body language that I realized <clears throat> I didn't have to write much, you know? So I let the artwork tell the story. I don't want to, <clears throat> um, you know, just repeat what's already there in the artwork. So anytime I can let just the artwork tell the story uh, that, you know, makes my job a lot easier. You know, Mike, I get a lot of value out of having access to, to friends who, who make comics. Iron sharpens iron. I can show them pages. They can show me pages. I learn a lot from these fellas uh, sitting next to me. You mentioned Art Adams uh, earlier and uh, Steve Purcell also. Uh, did you guys go to the same school, uh, the same art school? You lived in a close vicinity. And uh, was that an influence? Did that help level up your your ability uh what was what was that period of time because that's definitely like pre-long shot art adams you're dealing with yeah i mean uh, steve and i did go to the same school <clears throat> so we um we knew about each other because we had the same teacher i think i went to that school for two years so i think the first year i heard about steve and the second year we actually got to know each other so uh that was great i learned a lot it, it's hard to say I learn from him, but because he's his influence are from an entirely different planet. <clears throat> but we spent a lot of time together, and he's you know uh, there's a lot of the humor in Hellboy is very influenced by the humor in his stuff. In fact, I think I stole without intending. I think I stole one of his better lines for Hellboy. Um, and Arthur was do, hitting the conventions. <clears throat> Arthur's a few years younger. He was hitting the conventions the same time I was hitting conventions. So we got to know each other and he didn't live that far from me. And eventually <clears throat> he lived, he moved in the same building Steve and I were living in. So there's a, a, you know, a few years there where we lived like the guys on Seinfeld. Um, that's when Seinfeld started. I thought no one's going to understand this show because nobody lives like that except us. <laughs> uh, where you just go, well, I'm supposed to work today, but hmm, let's just go to the movies instead. Um, 
and that's how we lived for a few years. So um, I think we all, in a nice way, I mean, that was my, that was my, my peer group, you know, it wasn't like I grew up with a lot of people that were into comics and everybody wanted to go do, do comics together. Um, the beauty is none of us, none of us stepped on each other's toes. None of us were going out for the same jobs. Nobody was jealous of the other guy. Steve was doing one kind of thing. Arthur was clearly always going to be the commercial successful superhero guy. And I was doing whatever the fuck I was doing. So we just kind of bounced around together and, and, you know, I think influenced each other in, in ways. Uh, they're, they're, they're doing a documentary now and Steve and Arthur are both on it so they can probably explain it better than I can. Do you have a contemporary peer group that you kind of talk shop and, you know, workshop things with today? No, no, just me and the cat because my wife doesn't care. Uh, no, it's just, I talk to the cat and, you know, I, uh, I, I lean pretty heavy on my, my editor. Um, but you know, where I live, there's nobody who does comics. So, um, you know, in the New York days, there were periods there where I knew a lot of the guys and, and hung out with a lot of the guys in New York, but since I've been here, yeah, not so much. When, uh, yeah. when you were in school, were you doing like comics or was it a lot of painting and stuff? Because you said like ink was kind of something you just sort of came to. Yeah, I did. I did a lot of black and white stuff. Uh, I didn't do comics. I never did. I never did comics. Um, I shouldn't say never. I think I did maybe two or three. I don't even, I wouldn't even call them sample pages. I, I did two or three pages at one point just to see if I could draw a comic book scene but I don't even know if they were in my portfolio when I went up to Marvel, because when I went to Marvel, I was clearly looking for inking work. So when I, by the time I went up to Marvel, I wasn't even, you know, showing them uh, any kind of storytelling samples because it wasn't what I intended to do. So I was just doing black and white illustration stuff. The teacher um, that Steve and I had in common, Steve had done a ventriloquist dummy, uh, a Woody Allen ventriloquist dummy. So the teacher would talk to me about the Woody Allen guy. And then to Steve, uh, the same teacher would refer to the Bernie Wrightson guy, which was me, because he knew I was really into Wrightson and I was doing the black and white creepy kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that's what I was doing. I, I did some painting. I did a little bit of everything, um, but I wasn't doing comics. So I've, I'm also curious, like preparing for this, I was looking at, you know, your, your bibliography and, and it's kind of staggering how much you have done in the last, I don't know, 25 or 30 years. How do you manage your schedule? Like what does a week look like? Um, are you multitasking virtually all the time? Are you writing, uh, you know, all the time? Like, like, can you walk us through maybe your production process a little bit? Mostly involves turning on the, computer in the morning and being afraid of what my emails might show. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, I, there's a certain amount of time that's like, there's so much stuff that involves me in little ways, like just, you know, logo colors and approving this and approving that. There's a certain amount of that stuff that just, I can't get away from, you know, it's just, should the, creator titles be here or there or you know just silly little bullshit stuff that takes up more time than you want it to but usually I'm working on one thing at a time um right now I have a list of covers that need to get done somewhere in the next few months um I've written a bunch of plots for comics so when those comics are done they will at some point they'll say, we need, you know, the comic's done, now script the comic. So that's a couple days. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a juggle, but I do a lot less than I used to. So, um, you know, I don't work the long hours I used to work, uh, but I, I try to, you know, focus on one thing at a time. I recently wrote a three issue mini series. And instead of drawing, you know, writing one issue and then when the artist needs the next issue, I'd write it. I just wrote the whole three issue mini series in one, one go. So it's like writing a book. Um, 
I've now forgotten all about it, but there's a gigantic stack of paper right here next to my desk that's various plots, uh, scripts, and little sketchbooks that, that are full of like notes. So I know that when this one book comes back, I got to dig through all this stuff and look for all the pieces that I, I, I wrote down at one point. Hope I, I can find all the pieces. I've gotten a little bit better about organizing stuff. I used to, you know, write notes for everything and then pin them up or put them in drawers and then came time to script the comic and I go, mm, I, I have no idea what I intended because usually there's a long period of time between when I plot something and when I write it. And I remember there was a comic recently, the comic actually is coming out this year, Acheron. Um, I, I worked on that for a long time and I wrote so many different versions of the plot and I drew it. And then months later I had to script it and I never found uh, the, 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 the original script. I, I found a million different versions of that story, but I never found the version that I actually drew. So I just had to kind of make it, make it up. So, so Mike, uh, let's, let's wrap things up. You super generous with your time. Uh, what projects, what books are, are coming out forthcoming stuff that you would like to promote to, uh, to our audience? Well, um, so many of these things, it's, you know, I, I lose, there's so many different projects and some of them haven't been announced yet. And I can never quite remember what has been announced and what hasn't been announced. So I don't want to promote stuff that hasn't been announced yet. Um, my comic, Acheron, uh, is coming out at, in December, I think. Um, a very long gap where I didn't draw comics. So um, I'm very excited about that. Uh, very happy with that. That is meant to be chapter one of a longer mini series that uh, Ben Stenbeck will draw. So Acheron is step one of a, a, another project. Um, I just finished illustrating Pinocchio, which will be a, uh, hopefully a very nice book that will come out of uh, Beehive Press. Um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's in the works that I can't talk about. I'm just trying to look at the reflection in your spectacles to see <laughs> if I can get a get an image of uh, your computer screen. <laughs> and, and I'm just seeing uh, a reverse image of us. Yeah, I would think you just see. An, yeah, I don't think there's any secrets here, and I don't think you can see my drawing table because that's got something on it that I can't talk about. There, there's uh, a new Hellboy this week. What's right? that? There's a new Hellboy out this week, isn't there? Yeah, right. is, it, uh, is Bones of Giants out this week? Um, yes, that's what I have in my notes. Out this week, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, but again, it, it's so funny because those are the projects that have been going on, going on for so long. So I never know. I never know when anything is coming out. Right. I, I have no sense of of publishing schedule. I don't go to the comic shop anymore, so I don't know what. I, until my comps show up, I don't know something's been published. Um, or I see stuff online, but um, yeah, there's always stuff. There's always stuff. But again, so much of the stuff is, uh, you know, other people are writing it and, and, you know, my name is on it as co-plotter because at some point we talked about stuff. Um, I'm constantly bouncing ideas back and forth with other writers, but I don't know what, what stage those projects are actually, you know, turning into something. Cause I'm just the, mostly these days, I'm the idea guy. I'm the emails and phone calls and bouncing ideas back and forth. And then other guys are going off and doing things with that, with that stuff. People could find you uh, on social media, Instagram, Twitter, I believe it's at art of MM. Maybe <laughs> uh, I get, my wife does all that stuff. I, I, I just do Facebook and then some of what's on Facebook. I think my wife picks up and puts it on Instagram. Super cool. Well, listen, Mike, thanks so much for taking the time. I, I did want to say the, the thing you guys did the other day where you talked about the very first issue of Hellboy 
that you point out something that I wouldn't do now. And you were exactly <laughs> right. Ah, oh, cool. Um, there it, a, it, it stuck gun. out like a sore thumb for some reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny. You guys did it. I mean, I've seen various people do kind of analysis of my stuff. And I'm usually yelling at the screen going, no, that's completely wrong. That's exactly <laughs> not why I did that. Uh, but you guys are right more often than not. So I'm, I was very, I've been very impressed. I'm going to put that merit badge on my little Boy Scout sash. Yeah, I think we cut that out and put it at the front of the video. Yeah, right? yeah I think you're right, man. I'll, I'll edit this one. Got to give shouts to Uncle Jeff Darrow for hooking us up. The great Mike Mignola. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you.